In the United States, the four largest automobile manufacturers account for about 90% of all automobile output. Obviously, automobile production is a very concentrated industry, comprised of just a few giant firms. That pattern is the same in the cereal breakfast food industry. The four largest companies produce about 87% of all output. Flooring, electric lamps, tires, cigarettes, aircraft, and pre-recorded music are examples of industries that exhibit high degrees of concentration. These types of industries are called oligopolies. In our economy, oligopoly is synonymous with big business. oligopoly behavior is the intense rivalry and complicated linkages that exist between firms. So far in our class, the output decisions for perfectly competitive firms, for monopolistically competitive firms, and for monopolies have been simple to describe. Firms equate marginal revenue with marginal cost. In competitive markets, whether perfect or monopolistic, we've assumed that there are so many firms that the decisions made by one don't make a difference. And with monopoly, there's only one firm, so its decisions stand alone. But with oligopoly, there's no simple formula to determine optimal output. Decisions are made only after considering the reaction of the competition. So just like in a game of chess, when managers have to decide how much to produce, what price to charge, or how much to advertise, they have to think about how rivals will respond. That's called strategic decision making. Because output and pricing decisions in oligopoly are so much like a game of chess, we'll talk about oligopoly using game theory. Game theory is a branch of mathematical analysis developed during the 1940s. The theory begins with a description of three elements that are common to every game. We describe the players, the strategies, and the payoffs. Let's begin with a very simple game. We have one player, Bob, and Bob has two strategies, or moves he can make in the game. He can choose red or black. If he chooses red, he wins $10, and if he chooses black, he wins $5. Well, here's a way of describing the game. We indicate our player, the choices the player can make, and the payoffs that correspond to each of the choices. Well, we'll assume Bob has complete information. If Bob is rational, we can predict the move that Bob will make in this game. It's red. Now let's complicate things just a bit and think about two players, A and B, who will simultaneously make a move. A has two strategies, up or down. B also has two strategies, left or right. In this game, there are four possible outcomes. A can choose up and B left, A can choose up and B right, A can choose down and B left, or A can choose down and B right. Next, we need to describe the payoffs to A and B that correspond to each of these outcomes. An easy way to do this is by using a payoff matrix. Here's an example for this game. A payoff matrix is an example that describes a simple game. The matrix shows the payoffs that correspond to each strategy. So if A chooses up and B chooses left, the payoff to A is 40 and to B, 75. If A chooses down and B chooses left, the payoff to A is 50 and to B it's 25. If A chooses up and B right, then A wins 25 and B 50. And finally, in the lower right cell, we see that if A chooses down and B right, then A wins 30 and B 40. Remember how we could predict the behavior in our first game with Bob choosing red or black? Well, let's see if we can do the same thing for this game. When we look at the payoff matrix, we see that A will always do better by choosing down, no matter what B chooses. Here's why. If A thinks that B will choose left, then A wins 40 by choosing up, but 50 by choosing down. And if A thinks B will choose right, then A wins 25 with up, and 30 with down. In this situation, A has a dominant strategy, which is down. B doesn't have a dominant strategy in this game. B is better off left if A is up, but better off right if A is down. If we assume A is rational, 
A will choose down. B, knowing that A will choose down, will choose right, comparing 25 and 40. So we find the solution to the game at the down right cell. This cell is known as a Nash equilibrium, named after John Nash, who introduced the concept in 1951. A Nash equilibrium is defined as a combination of strategies such that either player is doing the best it can, given the strategy of the other play. At a Nash equilibrium, neither player has an incentive to switch strategies. It's time once again for Smart Guy, Dumb Guy. I'm having this reaction to the word equilibrium. I can't stand it anymore. What's the problem? Nash equilibrium. I don't get it. It's easy. Um, let's make up a simple game, okay? I can choose red or white, and you get to choose fish or beef. Wow, what a great game. Not. <laughs> now look, okay. <laughs> We just have to draw this thing out. Okay, here. Okay, we'll make a payoff matrix which shows us our utility levels for each combination of wine and meat. My complete meal group is ramen noodles. I can't relate to this. Okay, now look. Okay, I put my decisions here and yours up here. Okay? I can choose red or white and you can choose fish or beef. So we have four entries. All right, now, I'll put my utilities in first and yours in second. I don't like wine. Okay, I'll make yours low and screwed up. Okay, here it is. Now, if I choose white wine and you cook fish, I get 10 noodles of happiness and you get one. Oh, what a deal. Like, no wonder I don't dig this game. And if you cook beef, uh, then I get one noodle and you get two, okay? If I bring red wine and you cook fish, I get one noodle and you get two. But if I bring red and you cook beef, I get 10 noodles and you get one. So where's the Nash thing? Okay, here's how we figure it out. Okay, you go to any square like the uh, white fish one, okay? Now, if there's no incentive for me to switch and there's no incentive for you to switch, then that's an equilibrium. So, in this one, assuming you'll cook fish, I'm comparing 10 to 1. Okay, now, so I don't have any in incentive to switch to red, but you're assuming I'm bringing white. So you compare one to two. So, you think I'll bring white, you cook beef. So fish, white, isn't in equilibrium. I can't stand it, man! Okay, now look, look, we can do this for every square, and we find out in this game that there's no equilibrium. For example, at red and beef, I wouldn't switch, but you'd want to, see? Was it, so why doesn't this game have a solution, like you know, the one on TV? Look, that's because you have no taste in wine. But if I switch the payoffs for you to um, something reasonable, okay, like this, then there are two solutions, see? Now, at white and fish, neither, enough, neither of us have any incentive to switch strategies. So that's a Nash equilibrium. And so is red and beef. Got it? Do you think this will be on the test? Count on it. Oh, man. All right, let's do it again. But this time, let's use chips and beer. Let's see how we can use game theory to figure out the advertising budgets for two large firms, firm number one and firm number two. These firms produce similar products and compete for market share. They have two strategies, to advertise their products or not. Here's a hypothetical payoff matrix in terms of profits. If Firm 1 and Firm 2 both advertise, each earns $100. If Firm 1 advertises and Firm 2 doesn't, then Firm 1 wins market share and earns $200 in profits, while Firm 2 only earns $50. The same result is flipped if Firm 1 doesn't advertise, but Firm 2 does. Finally, if neither firm advertises, they'll each earn $150 in profits. Firm 1 earns higher profits by advertising no matter what Firm 2 does. So we know Firm 1 will choose to advertise, the dominant strategy. Firm 2 will also advertise because it has a dominant strategy in advertising also. An important thing to notice is that the equilibrium outcome, both firms advertising, is not Pareto superior. 
That's because both firms could do better off by not advertising. The problem is that the no advertising strategy is unstable. Each firm has economic incentives to switch over to the advertising strategy. This type of game is an example of a prisoner's dilemma, a classic game of, that appears in economics in many variations. The game is between two prisoners, Bob and Ray, who committed a serious crime. The police only have enough information to gain a conviction on a lesser charge, which leads to a three-year jail sentences for both Bob and Ray. But each prisoner has the option of confessing to the more serious crime. If Bob confesses and Ray doesn't, then Bob is rewarded with a reduced penalty of just one year in jail, and Ray goes to prison for ten years. The same offer is made to Ray. If he cooperates with the police and Bob doesn't, then Bob's in for ten. If both confess, then each are sent to prison for six years. Here's the way the payoff matrix looks for this game. In this game, we show the strategies to confess or remain silent. If Bob confesses, and so does Ray, then both get a six-year sentence. If Bob confesses and Ray remains silent, Bob's sentence is one and Ray's is ten. It's symmetric if Bob remains silent and Ray confesses. A sentence of ten for Bob and one for Ray. If both remain silent, each gets a three-year sentence. Notice that confession for both prisoners is dominant. If Bob believes Ray will confess, then six years is preferable to ten, so Bob will confess. If Bob thinks Ray will remain silent, then again, it's optimal for Bob to confess since one year is better than three. Now, what should Bob and Ray do if they can communicate? A natural outcome is for them to cooperate, collude, and agree to remain silent. Cartels are groups of producers within an industry who agree on pricing and production decisions. Although collusion is illegal in the United States, executives from several large companies, including General Electric and Westinghouse, have gone to jail for fixing prices. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is a good example of an ongoing international cartel that tries to limit oil production. But, as game theory shows, there are always incentives to cheat, so the outcome is not stable. Department of Justice officials have promised further arrests as the crackdown on suspected subversives gathers momentum. We want to know that when players repeat prisoners' dilemma games over time, certain strategies lead to cooperative outcomes. Firms who expect to interact for many years might build reputations for not defecting. Experimental economists have watched people play repeated dilemma games with monetary rewards. Observations have shown that a kind of a tit-for-tat strategy will lead to a cooperative outcome. This strategy says, on the next game, choose what your opponent did on the current game. Now, sometimes ga games involve sequential play, where one player gets to move first. Let's think about a software company, Mindware, that's considering introducing a new product, High Velocity. The marketing department has decided that Mindware can introduce the product using a large media budget or mostly rely on present distribution, placing high velocity alongside current software and using cheaper point-of-purchase advertising. As long as Mindware is the sole provider of the high velocity program, total sales will be the same regardless of the advertising method, but the timing of the sales will be different. If Mindware blitzes the media, then gross profits will be higher initially and then taper off. With word of mouth, profits are low initially, then build as, as users learn about the software product. Well, here's the data in terms of present value. In year one, Mindware revenues are either $800,000 or $300,000, and in year two are either $200,000 or $700,000. So total revenues over two years are the same, $1 million. Under the big budget scenario, advertising costs are $600,000 and with a small budget, just $200,000. So the net profits are either $400,000 or $800,000. Apparently, the small budget marketing strategy is best, with double the profits over the two-year period of time. Now, let's complicate things and think about a competitor, Myware, that can unlock the program code and clone the product within a year. The cost of cloning is $250,000, and if the clone is introduced, the market will be evenly split. The game is sequential. 
First, Mindware decides on the budget, then Myware decides whether to clone or not. A good way to describe a sequential game is in terms of a decision tree. Decisions are made at nodes. After nodes come branches which can point to other nodes or to terminal outcomes or payoffs. Here's a diagram that graphs the three decisions Mindware has. They can produce the program and introduce it with a big budget, a small budget, or not introduce high velocity. After making the decision, Myware has decisions to make that are shown as three new nodes on the diagram. Corresponding to each of Mindware's decisions, Myware can either enter or stay out. Finally, we have to figure out the payoffs for each strategy, which we indicate on the final branch of the tree. If Mindware blitzes and Myware enters, Mindware earns $800,000 the first year and $100,000 the next. After subtracting the ad expense, the net profit is $300,000. Myware spends $250,000 during the first year with no profits and then earns $100,000 the next, so their net profit is minus $150,000. If Myware doesn't enter, Mindware's net profits are the same as before, $400,000. Now, let's look at the second branch of the tree. If Mindware uses a small budget and Myware enters, Mindware earns $300,000 the first year and $350,000 the next, for a net profit of $650,000. Myware spends $250,000 in cloning during the first year and then earns $350,000 the second for a net profit of $100,000. Well, now that we see the game, let's solve it. We do this by pruning the tree backwards. If Mindware chooses the big budget strategy, Myware is comparing a minus $150,000 with zero. The rational decision that Myware can make is to stay out of the market. So the enter strategy is lopped off. This means the real payoff for Mindware by choosing the big budget strategy is $400,000. Let's write this above the big budget branch. Using similar reasoning, we see that if Mindware chooses a small budget, Myware will enter the market. That's because Mindware compares $100,000 net profits with zero and clones the software. Since Myware enters, the payoff to Mindware is $650,000, and we write this amount on the small budget branch. Finally, the payoff for the remaining, both remaining idle is zero, and we write this on the nothing branch. Now we know the solution to the game. Mindware has a choice of earning $400,000, the big budget outcome, or $650,000, the small budget outcome. The rational choice is to introduce the product via normal marketing channels and anticipate the clone within a year. Guerrilla marketing is, is very similar to guerrilla warfare. In fact, a lot of books that you will see on advertising executive shelves now uh, are books that refer to war uh, and, and the best way to attack the best way to make inroads into uh, superior defensive structures or, and, and those types of things. So you'll see On War by Klaus von Clausewitz. Uh, you'll see those books on advertising. Marketing Warfare is a very popular book that was on uh, advertising executive shelves throughout the country. It was a bestseller in the business book world. And basically what they taught was that you look at the broad picture of a person that you are eventually going to find your product marketed against and you shape your market to their most vulnerable point. But if you attack them head on, chances are you're going to leave. You're going to lose the battle. Uh, and so you will see you will see products that could compete in a variety of different fields. The computer, for example, you can buy accounting software on an Apple computer. You can buy word processing on Apple computers, but they knew that wasn't going to be the mainstay of their, of their market life. That wasn't what was going to allow them to survive. They, they couldn't convince enough people to leave, leave IBM who they had, a, who those people had a strong affection for. They'd use their typewriters for years. They wouldn't buy another one, uh, those types of things. So Apple realized that it had to move into a unique custom market. Then hopefully 
own that once that market, once that territory, once that high ground was taken and was, could be held and fortified, then you could start to branch out into other areas and convince people that there were other things that you could do well uh, 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 in addition to what you originally did uh, or what you originally programmed your product for. Although I will say that they also knew that they would probably lose, that those would just be additional markets. And in some cases, products will decide not to branch out into those areas because they'll take the profit side of their business and they'll spend it on a money draining end of their business with no real good return in sight. And it's all part of the marketing, advertising, consumer uh, identification, consumer acceptance field. Game theory has revealed that collusion can be fragile and lead to price volatility. But in some industries, there may be a strong desire for price stability. Firms are reluctant to change price even if costs change. One of the earliest models of oligopoly behavior attempted to explain sticky prices by using a kinked demand curve. Every firm in the industry faces a downward sloping demand curve with special characteristics. And now it's time for Chalk Talk with your host, Miss Sarah. Now we're going to look at a kink demand curve that an oligopoly faces. If an oligopoly is in a market where the firms react to every single price change that an oligopolist make, they're going to face a fairly inelastic demand curve. That is, as they change their price, if every other firm in this market changes their price, the quantity that they sell isn't going to vary very much. So this is where their f competitors react to a change in price that they make. Another case might be that their competitors don't react. In which case, a change in price that this oligopolis makes might have a very substantial change in the quantity that they sell. In that case, they have a very elastic demand curve. The price is very, um, or quantity is very respondent to a change in price. So, let's say we have an oligopolis. And they're starting from this point right here, with this level of price and this level of quantity. If they raise their price, their competitors are not going to react. So they'll be facing a very inelastic demand, I'm sorry, elastic demand curve if they raise their price. So their demand curve will look something like that. If they lower their price, their competitors will react. And then in that case, they'll face a very elastic, inelastic demand curve. And the demand curve will look something like that. With this kind of demand curve, generates this kind of strange looking marginal revenue curve. As you remember, the marginal revenue has twice the slope of the demand curve. So it'll go like that, it'll drop down for a while, and then it'll look something like that. Now, if a oligopolis sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, and marginal cost is here, they'll produce this quantity. Marginal co cost could raise significantly. It could go all the way up to here, and they would still produce the same quantity. So when you have a kink demand curve, major changes in costs will not affect a change in price or quantity for the oligopolis. Each firm believes that if it raises prices above P star, none of its competitors will follow suit. So if it does raise price, it will lose a lot of market share. So the demand curve to the left of Q star is very elastic. On the other hand, the firm believes that if it lowers price below P star, every firm will also lower price. So the demand curve to the right of Q star is quite inelastic. So at P star, the demand curve has a kink, flat to the left and steep to the right. When we superimpose the marginal revenue curves that are derived from the demand curve, we see a vertical region at the kink. Now, let's superimpose the firm's marginal cost curve. Using the marginal revenue equals marginal cost rule for profit maximization, 
We see that costs can change up or down, yet the price remains constant at P star. Well, now, how is P star determined? Explicit collusion is illegal, but firms may get around this by using price signaling. Signaling is a form of implicit collusion. A dominant firm in the industry might announce a price change in a press release. Other firms read this as a signal to follow suit and raise prices also. Suppose $5 is a Nash equilibrium price in a small oligopoly, but that if the firms could collude, all would be better off by charging $10. How quickly do firms respond to price changes? Just a short time ago, the price of a gallon of unleaded was $1.24, and not just at this station, but everywhere else. A bit later, the price went up by 12 cents to $1.36 a gallon, which was a 10% increase at all stations. Our examination of oligopoly has revealed there exists an interdependence between rival firms. Price and output decisions are coordinated, yet there's an inherent conflict. An individual firm wants to maximize its own profits, yet too much competition is destructive to all firms. It's not known how this balance plays out. Almost certainly, the nature of oligopoly differs between industries, some more collusive and some more competitive. In microeconomics, perfect competition is an abstraction that's used as a yardstick to measure the degree of market efficiency. The presence of concentration in an industry, such as we see with oligopoly, is an example of a market failure where inefficiencies arise. These inefficiencies lead to the microeconomic justification for the role of government to correct imperfections. And that's where we're headed, so stay tuned.